Um, let me just uh, quickly introduce myself and our panel. Uh, so uh, I'm Abhinav. Uh, I'm a partner with Parthenon. We are an education advisory firm. And with us, uh, we actually have a multi-continent team here uh, from the four corners, the five corners, the six corners of the world. So I'm, I'm based in Singapore. I've got Imad with me who's coming from the Middle East, from UAE. We've got Paul is in New York. Uh, Paolo from Brazil and Maria from Australia. So we've got a pretty, you know, it's literally our global team over here. Uh, I'll quickly introduce them. Um, so Imad is the founder of uh, Cedar Bridge, uh, which is an investment fund based in the Middle East. And Imad is actually one of the most experienced education investors uh, from that part of the world. Uh, he will uh, hopefully share a lot of his experience working in, the, in, in looking at education models and companies as well as what the governments have been doing in uh, the workforce development and training space. Uh, Paul uh, is the founder of a company called Voxy, which is into English language uh, provision and training. Um, and uh, he has, of course, comes with a lot of experience from the industry itself, uh, non-education background, but then moved into education. Uh, and clearly, again, in the scope of uh, training and skills development, especially around language abilities. Uh, Paolo uh, represents uh, Croton, um, and Croton is the largest higher education provider in Brazil, um, the leading company uh, in the market. And so he, of course, ch tackles these questions around employability and skills on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as he speaks, he will probably talk a little bit more about the Brazilian context and the company. And definitely not the least, uh, but in the last is uh, Maria, who represents Navitas. Navitas, uh, some of you may know of them because of their pathways business, but Navitas also has a very large professional training uh, business in Australia, as well as a global business called SAE, which is in audio, sound, audio, audio visual training as well. So. Navitas is into professional education, again, very relevant to our conversation today. So with that quick introduction, let me just uh, um, set the context uh, for our topic. So workforce uh, development, uh, hiring practices, best practices, we've been hearing about that. In fact, there are lots of panels going on uh, at the conference around this particular topic. And this is, you know, we don't need to state the problem. The challenges are well documented and written about and spoken about, debated about, that you know, there needs to be more seamless connectivity between what the education system is producing and what the employment or the, uh, or the need of em employers are, not, ju not just at the initiation stage, but on an ongoing basis. So the problem is very clear. Now, with, on our panel, we actually have a lot of folks here who are running fairly successful organizations trying to address these exact issues. And so I would like to kick off this conversation with the first question is that, what are the hurdles that you face as leading operators in these markets to bridge this gap? So we talk about this gap all the time, but what are we doing? What are you seeing work for you? As we, and maybe perhaps, Paolo, would you like to start off uh, for, with your experience in Brazil, talk a little bit of, for, for the benefit of the audience, just give a little bit more context of the Brazilian market. Sure. Um, so, as Abhinav mentioned, the company I work for is Croton. Croton is the largest uh, for profit, private, post secondary uh, education company in Brazil, maybe one of the largest in the world, um, both in revenues and in student base. So we have around 1 million students pursuing some sort of college degrees. Uh, we also provide uh, books to K through 12 schools. And just to give you a little background information about the company, so we did our IPO in 2007, and we had a market cap of $200 million. So this year, we are a company of $5 billion in market cap. So this is how big the opportunity and the challenges in Brazil is. Um, but although we are super big, we only have 17% of the market share in a market that is very, very underpenetrated. Only around 17% to 18% of the population from 18 to 24 years old are actually in college. So there's a lot of room for growth. Um, and we are just like seeing this boom in the country, uh, especially in higher education. 
when you go to the K through 12 market, like the, the penetration is close to 100%. You still face uh, an issue of quality, but the, uh, very, very uh, um, well penetrated. So Brazil is a large country. We, we, we are like three times bigger than India in terms of um, the size of the land, almost the size of the United States. We have 200 million people. So one of the, 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 the biggest challenges we have is accessibility. We have like 5,000 cities in the country. Uh, many of them are small cities, and they don't have any provider of education in those cities. Um, so the first big challenge is how do you offer education in a country that is so big? Um, the income per capita is super uh, low, so the government doesn't have enough uh, money to provide free education for everyone. So the private sector is doing like a, a very important job to increase accessibility uh, to the population. So this is one of the hurdles, one of the biggest challenges that we have. The other one is how do you provide degrees and content and curriculum that is relevant to the market. Um, so we are trying to develop different things to, to accomplish this mission. Um, the curriculum is competency-based, um, which is, We've seen like tremendous results because of that. It's very in sync with what the market needs. Um, we are trying to use as much technology as possible because another hurdle that we have is we have 15,000 teachers uh, in our uh, operation. So to be able to find good teachers that are able to, deliv to, de to deliver um, a good class is also a very big challenge. So we've been using a lot of technology, distance learning, uh, to be able to tackle this issue. So this is like uh, some of the issues and the challenges that we have in the country. Right. So that's, it, you, you touched upon some very interesting points. So one, you spoke about just fundamental access. Two is you spoke about the, the price challenge, which limits the quality of education or how much you can invest behind developing content curriculum. Third, you mo we said what's working for you is competency-based approach to the curriculum. So that's a positive. And fourth, you said that you are using significant amount of technology to solve essentially the first problem in access. Uh, could, you, could you highlight a little bit more around how are you engaging with the employers, considering how distributed your system is? So you mentioned that it's a huge, you know, it's a huge country and you are recruiting students and placing students all over the country. How are you engaging with employers at this local level to ensure that their requirements are being met in terms of the students that are graduating in local cities, small town cities, et cetera, where you're operating? Sure, and this is like maybe another area where <coughs> we are relying a lot in technology. So um, there are some companies that offer these online solutions where companies post their positions and people go there and try to find something that they like. Uh, but those solutions, they pretty much work only in big cities. So when you go to small cities, you don't have that solution working because you have a very big imbalance between positions being posted and people interested in those positions. So you need to create like a good balance for the system to work. So we decided to create our own solution for that. We call it Connecta. So it's basically a platform where the students go to uh, because we have all the information from the students. We know what their skills are. We also have like a test that tries to capture behavior uh, information for the employers. And so employers don't, they, they, come, they come to this platform, they don't have to pay anything, but one thing that they need to do is to provide us information uh, with regard to how many people they got in touch with, why they didn't hire some of the people, um, what, are, what was the salary that they offered for those people, and not only that, after they hire this person, they need to keep on giving back information about their career progression. And this is becoming the main platform that we are using to feed back the curriculum. Hmm. And, and update the content and the practices that we, we offer to students in the classroom. So it's a proprietary solution. We even use um, matchmaking algorithms to make sure. It's, it's, it's interesting because it's not that the students go there and try to find the best positions for them. The system recommends those positions that are more likely to suit their skills. Okay. Uh, so this is like one of the main mechanisms that you're using to be connected to the job market. Oh, thanks. Maria, your turn. Uh, more from, and you can choose whether you want to pick the Australian context right. 
or you can pick from SAE's example, of which is a more multinational context. Sure. Okay. Just a, a bit of context around the Australian yes, education please. markets. Australia has a uh, post-secondary education is a vocational sector and also a higher ed sector. Um, one of the challenges is those two things are quite separated uh, and, and managed by different parts of, of the government. Um, and so uh, in the vocational sector, relatively connected with jobs and skills and workforce labour needs. Uh, and like in, similar to Paolo in terms of um, employer groups and representatives getting together to, to figure out the curriculum and the competence, all competency based. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's fantastic. Although um, not really keeping up with the new types of jobs, it's mm. a bit too slow and that's one of the challenges. Mm. Very difficult um, when, when you get a lot of regulation um, and lots of consultation with industry, it just takes a bit too long and, and jobs are moving on and skills are moving on. and So being able to keep up with that is one of our challenges in the vocational sector. And in the higher ed sector, less connected directly um, as vocational sector to, to jobs and industries, except for professional bodies like accounting and so on. Um, one of the big issues really in, in education, to, uh, education to jobs is actually we see them as different sectors. And so the integration piece between those things is separated. It, it, it's like, uh, you know, there's the education sector and there's the jobs and skills sector. And so really we need to connect those um, much, much better. And one of those examples that you talked about in terms of that system sounds awesome. Um, uh, we don't have, um, we, there's many things, but not systemically in, in the education and labour market, that, that labour sectors that we can um, connect those. Uh, there's lots and lots of little things happening, but nothing systemic. And I think that's one of the challenges generally for the industries. Got it. Yeah. I think tighter coupling between the two systems. And yeah. You, you really highlight that point. And Connecta sounds um, really amazing. But I think those feedback loops are going to take a long time to develop. And, and mm. in almost every country I've ever been in, the educational systems move at a glacier uh, pace. Um, so I think that's where really the private sector opportunities <laughs> exist. And I think you see companies like Pluralsight and General Assembly um, doing a really good job of being nimble and stepping in and offering really high quality educational programs um, that do fit the needs of the almost constantly mute, like muting or mutable skills that are required in, wow. um, in today's world. Yeah. And Paul, would you want to talk a little bit more about the work that your company is doing in this particular space in terms of mapping these gaps uh, um, of skill sets? I think uh, you are more focused on the language space, which yeah. is also a big area of gap uh, in the emerging markets, especially when it comes to English language in non-native English language speaking countries, more from a professional standpoint. There are, of course, very big companies in that space who are addressing the business English need but we don't see too much of technology penetration over there. There are certain ma models that are coming up. Uh, what's the role that your company is playing? What is working for you in terms of uh, best practices and bridging these gaps? Yeah. So um, English is a, a huge gating factor to socioeconomic advancement in most, most of the developing world. Um, and I think that's intuitive to most people, but what might not be less intuitive is that most of the high quality training out there is also in English. So in order to get the right training to become a social media marketer or a web developer, you need the baseline English to even get access to that, that education. Um, so Voxy picks up the problem by trying to teach the English that the specific voca vocation that someone is pursuing um, requires. So there's lots of different ways you can say that English for specific purposes or career-driven English training. Um, but we, you know, we did a partnership with General Assembly where we'll actually take their digital marketing course and their data analytics course, and we'll turn that into an English learning course that can, you know, the goal of which is not to become a, you know, a data scientist, it's to learn the English that you need to be able to pursue that, that training. Um, and we think that is applicable very, very broadly, um, not only across the world, but across verticals. Okay. Imad, what are you seeing in the Middle East? Do you see any best practices, some models like these coming up, like Connect as a great example, Voxy is another great example. So. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're stuck with the problem one. <laughs> we have no <laughs> solutions. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the biggest, you, you know, your, your initial question, what's the biggest problem, at least in my uh, region? It's pretty much uh, the ministries of education yeah. because you need that st their stamp for validation, mm. and they're, they're in the ice age. I mean, uh, and they, they don't want to change. And uh, without their licensing, ta-ta-ta, 
okay pretty much you're uh, you're confined to very narrow uh, activities that you can do and to address some of these issues uh, you need to really be very innovative uh, so I mean we actually run the SAE a uh, business in, in UAE uh, uh, you know uh, as a franchisee of Navitas and we're confined to a free zone where we can actually provide the service yeah. it's a great program you know hands-on bachelor degrees so it is vocational from one end and it is uh, you know uh, uh, competency based on the other but uh, it's uh, it, we cannot go get out of a pretty much like a one square kilometer <laughs> zone uh, <laughs> if we want to get out there we we, we go on to the traditional models of education which will kill this great program uh, so that that's really the problem. We're we're trying to to figure out solutions. One of them using uh, technology to deliver, like uh, you know, uh, sector focused uh, language training and stuff like that. But we're experimenting at that, and so far we've failed. Very frankly, uh, it's not easy to. But we we keep on the momentum. <laughs> And that's very interesting what you mentioned because I think the role of the government is does influence the structure of the market quite immensely, especially uh, how skill sets are defined and recognized by the government. So what's the value of going through a particular program if it's not recognized by the government or the employment market as a direct job generator? Uh, and we see actually one of the interesting models that I wanted to share from our experience, which is from India. Uh, and where the exact same problem, as Imad mentioned, exists, which the government is absolutely not doing anything in terms of defining these skill sets, is uh, being run by a company called Manipal, which is India's leading uh, education provider. And what they have done is they have t said that, look, the government's not going to define skill sets for us. We don't need them. And they've gone directly to the industry and created these bespoke training models with the banking sector. And so what they've done is that they've tied up with the top 10 banks in India and they have developed what they call as the Manipal Banking Institute, which actually is a banking academy f catered you know, for every single bank. So the largest bank in India is ICICI. So they have a Manipal ICICI banking school, which is housed in the same facility as Manipal XYZ banking school as well. So it's not as if it's different. And the model is very neat. So they have, for all the on uh, all of their incoming recruitment, they have taken over from Manipal, or sorry, from the banks, and they go and recruit students on behalf of the banks, postgraduate, um, and they test them, do the interviews. They enroll them in a one-year long program, custom designed for that particular bank. The cost of that program is about $6,000, but the bank extends that uh, money as a loan to this education loan to the student which is great, it's a great banking product as well. <laughs> and the student can repay that loan over five years post completion at 0% interest if they continue working with, with the bank. And if they don't, they leave, if they, if they qu quit the company before that, then they have to pay interest on market level rates. So it's a great way to lock it in. So what do you have? You have 100% of recruitment being done on behalf of the bank by the education provider a program customized for the bank, right? Education cost being covered by the bank as a form of a loan, so you have instant payback on that education. And then, you know, the, uh, the completion rates are 98, 99%. Nobody really f finishes off. What's the annual salary for that $6,000 degree? So it's about, uh, now, now the dollar is like, like the rupee is depreciated like crazy, but when they started off, it was about $10,000 a year, oh, okay. yeah. Better than I was hoping so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great, so it's a great equation. The payback yeah, yeah, of that yeah. program is actually pretty sweet. So what Manipal has done with the banking industry is that they have said, okay, the government's not recognizing any sort of skills, any specifically to that. Let us go and de develop this, these bespoke models. Now, we all know 70, 80% of the banking is, is pretty common. It's the system or the processes that you would, they would customize for every single company but that works out pretty well for them. And that model has scaled up to about 4,000 students. They're partnered with the top 10 banks in the country, and that's working out pretty well. So you know, that's just an example where they just have created this very tight relationship with the employer base to 
uh, align the skill sets that they want, the kind of students that they want, mm -hmm. moving into it. So, you know, yeah. take, I, yeah. Actually, I'll share a similar experience. Uh, actually, it was a failure, but nevertheless, it was a ex good experience. <laughs> so we, 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 you know, we, we were somehow involved with one of the governments in Egypt. That, you know, uh, they change government quite uh, often. But one of the governments pretty much gave us uh, uh, the lead to to upskill a million workers. We actually came with them and told them we can we want to take this BHAG and really upskill a million workers in, in Egypt over seven years. And the, what we did is actually there are big gaps in the workforce, uh, uh, even like basics like agriculture, nursing, and so on. And we just addressed these. I mean, and worked with the employers to take basically the outcome. And the formula was quite simple. I mean, going back to how much it costs versus you know, what they get out of it. For what's worth two to three times your monthly salary, mm. okay, worth of training. So if, if you're gonna get $200 for $600 of training, you know, I can actually upgrade you to get that $200 job. Yeah. Sometimes from zero, you're unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it was a very quick uh, uh, return on investment. And we made a, a nice formula where uh, the government pays 90%, so it doesn't cover all our costs. The, and then the employer pays 10% or more, so we're incentivized to place them properly. So we mm. get the 10% and a bit more for our profit. And actually it worked for a few steps. And then there was change in government and then the whole program was uh, 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 put on hold. But it ac we actually graduated a few thousand people for ports, for agriculture, and uh, plastic industry, and so on. It was a good experiment. Yeah, okay. and then the government changed. Unfortunately. <laughs> I've seen a couple of good examples of government intervention. In Chile, there's this program called Sensei, yeah. which is a tax credit for employers um, for certain skill building. Um, and that, that, I think that drives the right incentives um, in, in the HR departments of large companies. Um, the downside of that is if you're Voxy in New York City trying to sell your product there, the, the, the government, because they're giving the tax credits, can often stipulate the, the potential pool of providers. Providers, yeah. Uh, so the and, and they can also sort of skew where the training dollars are spent, whether it's lower level workers or higher level workers. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the tax credit system was a pretty good one. Jamaica has a much sort of more fraught one, which is every company just pays a percent into what they call a heart fund, and then they create an almost like a social security-like um, sort of organization to administer training, which is a little bit scarier. Yeah. And Maria, like, uh, Australia is uh, right now in the news uh, because of uh, this, uh, this government funding. How are, I mean, what's your view again? I think the government, role of the government is quite important in all of these sectors as enablers, as, as, pe as perhaps a body that sets the requirements, recognizes skill sets, but then the funding component of it can sometimes throw businesses off and that's exactly what's happening right now in, in Australia. So what's been your experience uh, in terms of tackling that and how do you think then that the government could, um, could perhaps step up or change the way they approach funding or support for workforce skill development. And again, I think maybe for the benefit of the audience who may not be familiar with what's going on in Australia, spa Australian VET space, it may be useful to just per perhaps give two lines of context sure, as well. Sure, yeah, so uh, any government who takes its role in um, building the labour force will definitely want to have their hands right inside the regulation associated with education, formal qualified qualifications, and Australia's no different to that. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of sometimes over a period of time it's like tax law. You just keep tweaking around the edges until it becomes a real mess. And, and, and so um, sometimes tweaking one thing has, in terms of regulation, has an undesirable effect in another, um, in another area. And that's, that's what's happening right now in Australia. They, uh, the government is um, to fix one part of a problem. They're making a decision which creates issues elsewhere. Um, and creating disincentives for um, private providers in particular, where Navitas is a private provider of education. Uh, and um, so um, depending on the government of the day and their, uh, their thoughts around the role of private providers in the market, uh, you know, often, often those regulations are uh, sort of changed towards, uh, skewed to public 
public providers. And so, um, in depending whether you're in the higher ed space or the vocational space, and again, even considering the whole tertiary education as two separate sectors is an issue for us. Um, a lot of companies right now are, um, we see a lot of companies considering be, just because it's easier and more, more direct, like you guys have spoken about, doing it themselves um, outside, um, outside the accredited space in sort of a, taking up a 70-20-10 type of model of training and provide, providing um, training for their, for, their, uh, for their staff members. Um, especially in the 70 area where there's a lot of latent knowledge within a business um, between you know all the, the staff members you have uh, staff members who know a lot of things about certain areas within their business utilizing that leverage and that as much as possible nothing to do with re regulators nothing to do with qualified training and getting a lot of benefit out of that and so we're seeing a lot of companies um, talking with us about systems, um, you know, technology systems in particular, that can assist with that um, uh, sort of bringing them the social back into training uh, at scale across their organisation, global organisations as well. Um, so uh, we do see people, uh, organisations going around in a way, not just considering formal qualifications for their, for the workforce, mm. but, um, but uh, you know, non in the, in the non-accredited space, and that's quicker and faster and cheaper in a way. Uh, so we see a lot of movement in that space right now. Got it. So uh, as a next stop, could could we spend a bit of time talking about how you are engaging with employers as mm -hmm. part of this? So of course, Paolo's example of Connecta is a great one, mm -hmm. but is there something else, something that's been that you have seen work more better in these markets? So maybe Paul, maybe in your, uh, you know, in, in, in your line of work or Maria, mm -hmm. how are you guys tackling employers to un understand, interpret, and maybe shorten the lag time between the job creation market and actually the education market that you earlier mentioned? Any examples? There's, there's just one example that maybe I think it's worth mentioning. Um, together with the Connector, we, we, we are now developing lots of partnerships mm -hmm with people, for example, like Voxy, for mm -hmm. example, it could be one of the, our partners. Because of this, because the cycle is long, mm -hmm. when you get the feedback from the market, it takes a long time for you to really update the curriculum. We are doing something now that is similar to what LinkedIn is trying to do with lynda.com. Mm -hmm. So once we identify that, uh, w uh, once the system identifies that some students have gaps to fulfill uh, the requirements of a position, we offer to that student a set of courses, online courses, um, that might remediate that problem. Uh, we know it's not, uh, it, it's not good for everything, but for that last mile, sometimes it really, really helps. And we are talking about partnerships that are very interesting. For example, right now we are in, in deep engagement with Udacity mm -hmm. to see if we can bring them to this platform and offer the courses to the students when they are like about to enter uh, about to finish the, the, the graduate courses. And it, it's so far it's been working very well. We are still in the moment that where we are trying to attract more and more partners, um, uh, including, for example, in the English language space. Um, so this is like one way that we are trying to like reduce this hmm. cycle of getting the information from the market and updating the curriculum. Yeah. Got it. In, in our sort of situation, uh, for our professional ed uh, courses, w we do the normal things, which I guess everyone does, is a deep um, sort of integration with internships into pretty much all our uh, programs. Right. So connecting with yep. industry directly through internships and placements. And also um, our model typically for professional education uh, courses is that the, the teaching staff, the adjunct teaching staff are in the industry. And so whilst the curriculum, the base curriculum is the base curriculum takes a long time and turnover and get it through accreditation and so on, actually the delivery of the teaching um, in the class is delivered by people working in the industry so they can bring that mm -hmm. directly into the classroom, whether it be online or, or on campus. That's um, some of the things that we do. 
Understood. Understood. And that's very interesting. Coming back to Connector, which I really love this example. So, uh, how many users do you have? Like, how is it? Is it uh, entire network of Croton students on this, or is it being rolled out in phases? How many people are using it? How many employers are onto it? Could you share something with the? Sure, sure. Yeah, actually, we are rolling out the project, so it's not available everywhere in the country. Um, especially because we we understood very quickly that if if we don't have a good balance uh, of positions posted and students, mm -hmm. you do not create a platform that is interesting enough mm -hmm. for both parties. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are having to invest a little bit more on people on the ground to go visit some companies. Just to give a number, like six, around a little bit more than 60% of the employers of our students are companies that are very small. Like they have mm -hmm. like fewer than 100 employees, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because we are like in, in many cases like in small cities. So it's like this small shop that sometimes hires students from one of our campuses. Um, so we are now uh, in like four different states, but the idea is that to, until the end of the year and beginning of the next year, to, be, to make this platform available for um, every student and in every city that we have some operation. Will it be compulsory in some degree program that, that students sort of are active in maintaining their uh, the profile? Or yeah, I mean, we're we are also trying to work on that because it's kind of tricky yeah. if you make it compulsory or not. Um, but the more you create incentives for them to use, yeah. the more they use it, right? Yeah. And, and as, as you start like showing results and how many people are really getting jobs yeah. um, through the platform, the more other students come and join. So, so far we have around like 2,000 companies that are using the platform somehow um, and around like 100,000 students uh, wow. using the platform. So this is like 10% of the population. Um, but it's like it's in the very beginning of the project. So we're very optimistic about it. There are many challenges to overcome. For example, when you go to a small city, sometimes you find stories like, well, I, I don't want to use the platform because if I engage in conversation with a potential employer, maybe my employer will find out. And mm -hmm. so we are trying to find ways to somehow make the process a little bit more uh, not so open so that one potential employer can find out that a person from someone that they, they know is trying to change jobs. Right. Uh, so sometimes we have situations like that, um, but this is like how big the program is at this point. Yeah, and I, I think just for the context of the audience, a lot of the students which are enrolled at Croton are actually enrolled in evening or part-time programs, so they are already employed in some job. Right. And that's where this problem becomes of, right. of, of, of essentially having a discrete approach to uh, job shifting becomes even more more yeah, more. Yeah, important. our target audience is like low income people, so it's the base of the pyramid. Um, so, and like eighty five percent of of students are working adults um, that are somewhere like twenty eight to thirty years old, like the average. Yeah. So, so I think as we are entering the last 20 minutes, so we have a red countdown clock over there to keep us <laughs> honest, but last 20 minutes, I, I do want to spend about the, maybe the, uh, keep the remaining 15 minutes for Q&A, but before we move in there, one last question. So we have spoken a lot about, th this is mostly around entry level or inflow into the uh, work environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you seen any models or your own personal experience at the mid to higher level of workforce development, executive education, etc.? Uh, is there something that you have been following or you would, may want to share with the audience in terms of your experience over there? Any, anyone? No? Well, I mean, yeah. we, we've, we've been uh, following that space very closely. I mean, definitely it's... Uh, uh, there is a lot of activity. I mean, in Dubai, which is a small city, it's around eight hundred million dollars. Mm. So it's quite sizable for you know a city of two million people. Uh, uh, and you know, the, the question is, you know, it's all offline. How do you take that into hybrid or you know mostly online? Uh, and the the problem, I mean, today there is a lot of talk, at least where I come from, but actual models that actually deliver hybrid or online executive training are scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's a very fragmented sector, so by industry, you know, uh, finance, uh, have banking, da, da, da. So it, it's, uh, d there is no answer yet out there. You know, I'm trying to, get to go around and see if there are answers here to take them 
Hunter. over there. Sure. Paul? For, for English learning, um, I, I've, I've seen that quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that would typically work is your sort of rank and file would get a more self-paced where it's mostly using the software or interacting in group sessions. And then you would layer on a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction for executives. And that's a pretty tried and true model. Um, over time. I, I've seen one thing that I thought was really innovative, which was, um, it's actually a company we're not affiliated with at all, but it's a destination learning company. So they do study abroad programs, typically for college kids, but they're coming out with a new product, which is, uh, the way I think about it is almost like a Harvard executive MBA type thing, where it's four weekends in a summer hmm. and you know some touch points throughout the course. But it's like an eight week um, course designed around a working executive, which I thought was pretty interesting. And I think that hybrid model, um, is something that would likely you know, get, get traction when you're talking about sort of more senior people. Very interesting. In, in our context, most, most of our education is entry level or career changes. Um, however, uh, we, we are seeing um, companies working with executives um, in that sort of more social, online social um, space in the sort of 70, 20, 10, in the 70 part of that. Um, acting or re being required or training them, I guess, to act as mentors and leaders in that online space, which mm -hmm. is actually very challenging for them, mm -hmm. um, whereas their workforce is looking for, you know, um, it's connecting up with other people in the, in the company online through a social means, but it's a sort of the new age learning management systems, if you like, which are social enabled, social at the core rather than files at the core. Um, and the leadership of those companies, um, it's incredibly important that they are in there and, you know, sort of walking the walk. But uh, that, that is quite challenging for them. It's not what they're used to because typically you're at the front and you're the leading. You're telling people what's going on. But in a social setting online, it, you know, it's, it's very equal. Um, and that's not where their skill set comes from. So we're seeing um, a lot of uh, requests for that sort of training and mentoring in how to lead in online spaces socially with inside their company. Um, mm -hmm. That sort of movement, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, again, we're happy to open the floor to questions, so please, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll start taking one-on-one. -on -one. No questions? Yes, please. Yeah, not only the economic situation, but <laughs> there is a huge political crisis going on right now there, right? Um, so the government, so for those who are not familiar with the situation in Brazil, there is a very high chance that the president uh, will be impeached. And the lower house of representatives just approved the impeachment process to go to the next step. Um, and because of that, um, the country has stopped. So there are many projects that should be voted and move forward that are just not moving forward. Um, we always say that like education is a little bit resilient to moments like that. Um, so just to give you like specifics, for example, last year was our best year in history. We had our, uh, our, our student base reach like more than a million students. Um, we have like very high revenues. Um, but we know it, it's not forever, right? So if the situation doesn't improve, then at some point, we're going to start having problems. Well, unemployment is going high. It's close to 10%. Uh, so uh, customer confidence is going low. So people start to think twice uh, before they commit to something that will require money. Um, so uh, for now, we, we, we think that we are using it as a very good opportunity to uh, um, present to our target audience the benefits of having a higher education uh, degree. Um, we, we have very good data showing that students, before they join uh, one of our degrees, compared to when they graduate, the salary goes up by almost like 80%. So it's a very good investment for them. And especially because the penetration of higher education in Brazil is so low. And I think when you compare countries, those countries that have very low penetration in higher education, the differences in salary before and after graduation um, is very uh, clear and, and, and attractive to those who can afford to go to college. Um, so we're also using it as an opportunity 
but the biggest problem is the political crisis and, and how much people are not confident about the future and how long it's going to take for the situation to get better. Uh, so in the company, we say that we can only focus on what we have control on. So we are trying to do everything we can from an operational standpoint, but we cannot control the rest of the country. So we're just trying to do, we are very um, obsessed with execution. So the team is focused on execution and trying to do as much as possible. Um, so, but let's see, it's, 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 it's a very unique moment um, in the country, in the history of the country. And I was just talking about Raju Paul, he knows emerging markets a lot. And he said that he never saw anything like that. Mm -hmm. So let's see for how long it's going to last. About 50% of our business is in Brazil. Um, and I was there last month where on Sunday there was a, a peaceful sort of demonstration in the street with 3 million people on the street. <laughs> and uh, that was because they were planning uh, to arraign the former president for things like stealing artwork off the walls of the presidential palace. And by Thursday, they'd given him immunity. Um, and yeah, there was lots yeah. of peace. It was, it's very, very fraught uh, in general. But long term, it's an incredible market to be in. I, I'll stand by that. Yeah. Well, you know, w maybe it's bottoming out, or the button, uh, right? So that's the yeah. view: is, is that it's bottoming out right now, and hopefully the market picks up by end of, uh, by next year. So, but by yeah. the way, like the share price of the company from January first to now has been up by almost like thirty percent this year. Uh, this year. Wow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to guess what's gonna ne happen next, but still the fundamentals of the country in terms for education is really good. So very low penetration. There are some programs from, from the government that really give access to people who cannot afford to go to college. Uh, for example, out of this one million students that we have, 100,000 of them have full scholarships because of the government. And the government gives companies like us tax incentives for if on average, like out for every 10 students that pay a tuition, if you give a full scholarship, then you don't have to pay income taxes. And so this is a big incentive for companies like, like us to um, make sure that we have those students in, in, in our classrooms. And you had your best year even after the fees subsidy went away. Yes, we, yeah. So the end of 2014, the government changed the student financing program dramatically. Very similar to what they did in the U.S. in like yeah. Oh so wait, so yeah. they were about so in in Brazil about every year about seven hundred thousand students each year starting would get student lending and student financing, and that number was literally cut to half mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. And despite that, companies like Croton actually did better because what they were able to demonstrate is students are better off coming to providers like them and getting that payback on education, which Paulo alluded to earlier than going to a smaller, fragmented, lower priced, lower quality institution provider, which is exactly what should happen, which is what we term as flight to quality mm -hmm. in, 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 in any sort of educational business. And that's a great example, and companies have benefited massively if they're doing the right thing. And just one curiosity about the, we have, so out of this one million students, half is distance learning, and the other half is face to face. But we don't have, actually our distance learning model is not 100% online actually have a blended model, which is very good for engagement, um, for creating a sense of community. Um, so students need to go once a week to what we call a learning center. So we have like more than, a, a, around like a thousand learning centers around the, around the country. So if you are enrolled in one of those distance learning courses, um, we have those places in, in, in like, almost like a thousand different places where students need to go and they actually have a broadcasted class with their um, classmates. Um, and this is something that I think it's quite unique uh, compared to other distance learning models. So it's not 100% online, uh, especially because in the country we don't believe that 100% online um, is, is good enough uh, to create engagement. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, well, so let me quickly summarize some of the key points that we discussed. So number one was, I think having a strong connection to employers mm -hmm. seems to be critical. So in Connecta's example, Imad, you also mentioned that. We saw that in India with the Manipal example. So having this loop with the employers, a close loop with the employers is important. 
Number two, for the program that you're de delivering, you need to ensure student payback. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, the Egypt example, unfortunately the government <laughs> issues happened. Well, it worked for a few thousand <laughs> people. But, yeah, uh, for a few thousand uh, people who benefited. The target. Yeah, in the Brazil example, again in the India example, mm -hmm. uh, Maria mentioned as well. So having that payback on the program that you're delivering, especially showing that the incremental economic value that it adds to the students is extremely important and it's recognized at one end by the employers and the other end by the students and that will work. And I think then thinking using technology in innovative ways to enable these, these outcomes. So it's not as, as an end all but enabling them. So either using it to connect to employers, reaching out, increasing access, more and more uh, r reducing the time lag between the job market creation as well as uh, and the content creation so those are the places where technology can be used but clearly it's not it's not 100% especially in markets like middle east south asia southeast asia the story is very similar there are lot, still very clear and present barriers to adoption of technology recognition of technology based products engagement is a challenge like in brazil in most part of the emerging markets we have seen that it's very common so it will take time uh, so we, in the meantime, I think what needs to be done is use it smartly in places where you can make the difference. All right. Thank you so much for your time and attendance.